Hello, welcome to the Horticulturalists. I'm Matthew Lucas. And I'm Stephen Ryan. You are indeed, yes. and we are the Horticulturalists. We post every week on a Friday, so if you want to follow our continuing adventures, do hit subscribe and follow us on our journey. And don't forget we have our Monday shorts, so if you've got a horticultural question that you'd like me to answer, please put it in the comments below and we will get round to it at some point on a Monday. We will and if you are about to be horticulturally triggered by this video you might want to think about joining the Royal Horticultural Society of Victoria. Yes of which I'm patron Ooh. so I like to promote it. You haven't been cancelled yet. <laughs> no not yet. ticking. <laughs> yeah, yeah time will come. But Stephen Ryan I sense a familiar sign behind us Dixonia Rare Plants Nursery. Yes. What are we doing? One of our viewers popped up a comment and said why don't you tell us more about Dixonia Rare Plants and Stephen's Nursery? Mm. So we thought, well, there's a storyline we hadn't thought to do. No, ruthless promotion of your nursery. Yeah. But why not? Because it is beautiful. And I used to come here before I knew you. And it is just such a magical world. And because you've been here for so long, you've planted some things. As the song goes, which a woman ain't supposed to see. I've been to <laughs> paradise. Well, this is paradise for rare plants. So yes. why don't we go in? Have a look at some of, I don't know how many national collections you've got here. Just one. Just one. Just one. We can allude to that, but also some of the things you're growing, your yeah. propagation. And when it all started. When it all yeah, started. How it burnt down. Yeah, how it then re recame like from the ashes phoenix. like a phoenix. Oh, Stephen, and, uh, we could be here all day. Yes, but we won't. We won't. <laughs> yes. But let's go. Yes, into the nursery. Well, we're at the beginning. So let's start at the beginning, yes. as Julie Andrews would have said. So when people first come in, this is the vista that they get. Um, before we go into the history of you, yeah. know, you in the nursery, what do you put here? Does it always change in terms of what you put Oh, in yes. Front? In fact, I like to surround people with all sorts of interesting plant material as they come in. Mm. And so although this area is not under sprinklers and things, so I have to hand water it, it is probably one of my prime selling spots because mm. People walk in, they'll see something interesting. It has a large label in it to tell you what it is, what it does and how much it is. And so they can learn and read as they come into the nursery and hopefully end up right down at the bottom corner. Mm. Now I'm gonna very cleverly spin around. Now just, hang on, just over here is your bench where you keep your oxalis. Yeah, so they're all, the, they're all the summer species that are in flower there yeah. at the, or in foliage there at the moment. Uh, once they die down, I'll take them off, perhaps put the winter growing oxaluses up there mm. or other things that I want to uh, expose people to. Uh -huh. And we've done a video about this group of oxalis. Yep. And then again, cunning technique of swiveling here, we have the wonderful um, honeysuckle that yes. we did a video about, which yeah. is in bloom. Just, it's oh. coming, yes, and coming the, towards the end. And the fragrance, and that is? Lanisra Hildebrandiana, the giant Burmese honeysuckle. Oh, stunning. So we've covered that before, we've mm. done the entrance. So let's spin around again so that people can see deep into the nursery. Yes. So what was this site when you arrived and when did you get here? All right, well the site was a pile of blackberries, old sheds that had fallen down, the roofs were on the ground, mm. rubbish bottles, God knows what else, because it's right behind the Mount Nasset and General Store. So they would have used, they would have had sheds where they sold bags of briquettes and wood and all sorts of other stuff, mm. possibly even stock food and God knows what else way back. And so this site became available. A friend of mine owned the property at the time and said, well, would you like to use this site when I left the old family nursery? And that was in 1980. <gasps> So you were a precocious child starting oh, a business. I was, I was but a pup when I came now, down here. Let's talk, let's talk ruthless capitalism. So how much money did you have to start this, if you don't mind me asking? Because it's quite Nothing. an enterprise. Nothing. So how did you do it? Yeah, well, it was, well, it was partially off the largesse of the owner of the site because mm. for many years he gave me a complete nut of peppercorn rent. I think I was paying something like a couple of dollars a week. So that gave me the opportunity to start off. Mm. I only opened on weekends mm. in, initially, uh, and that meant I worked in other people's gardens the rest of the week. So I worked seven days a week, but mm. those gardens then supported me and anything the nursery made get, got plowed straight back into the nursery again. Mm. And so the only other thing I came into the nursery with was a reasonable amount of stock that I bought with me from our old family nursery, much of which got burnt in the Ash Wednesday bushfires three years later. So let's go. So 1980, 1983 was a cataclysmic yeah. year here, well in Victoria, but particularly on Mount Macedon. I think, is it 
the worst fire that's gone through this district in oh yes sort of modern since history. probably since the 1930s or earlier mm. it was certainly the worst fire that had come through here and it certainly created a glitch in my business plan. Mm. Fortunately, there was uh, one of our government instrumentalities, which was at the time called the State Electricity Commission, who actually took responsibility for starting the fire. So I was able to make a claim against the uh, SEC, as we called it, for losses and damages in the fire. So mm. that actually gave me some capital to get started mm. again. But it was not particularly good to have started a nursery. And of course, things you do in nurseries take years to mm. come to fruition sometimes. Mm. So I was just building the business up. And then the, well, the SEC admitted that I had about a 98% loss. Mm. So there you go. These but things happen. There are a few things that you had planted that survived. So we'll go and have a look at yeah, those. There are one or two, but there weren't many. And so I basically had to start off again. The only things that still were here were things like the driveways and the rock gardens, really, mm. apart from a few shrubs that survived. Well, talking of the driveway, once again, I'm going to be very clever and spin round, baby, right round, right round. Yes. And what you can see behind us is the entry to your nursery and just there is the trading post that you've mentioned yes now we've often filmed in the drive and in fact viewers we are making a 12-month drive cycle as it were yes not exactly. very wagnerian to show the drive in the whole in all the seasons because it's a small space and it's constantly evolving yep but i think the other thing about this site is that you have gorilla planted yeah. i mean we're surrounded there's a church there there's a restaurant cafe yeah. here but there's large trees yeah. All around the periphery, Stephen. Yeah. Who and did that? Me. I mean, there isn't anything growing here that I can remember that predates the nursery. Mm. So everything here, it might have just managed to survive the Ash Wednesday bushfire. So it may have been planted in 1980 or 81. Mm. But virtually everything was planted after the fire. So that's 80, uh, 84 really is when I got underway again, because the first 12 months after the fire, I was cleaning up burnt pots, getting rid of dead plants, mm. rebuilding the infrastructure, the shade houses, the greenhouse, all those different things that you need within a nursery mm. and getting the watering system in place and all those sorts of things. So mm. it took a little while to get all that infrastructure in place. And then I started major planting. And the only good thing about that is that I can now say to people that tree was planted in 1985 and I can do it with conviction because I know when things went in. Well, talking of which, is this that rare Chinese maple that we've yes. covered before? Yes, we saw that down in the uh, Botanic Gardens in yeah. Melbourne, mm. uh, Asa pentaphyllum, the five finger maple from China, mm. of which there's supposed to only be about 500 of them in the wild. And then over here, an Arbutus, I think. Yes, an Arbutus andragnoides, which is one of the hybrid strawberry trees. Mm. And there's a Nothophagus, the um, uh, southern beeches growing there as well. Yeah. So quite a range of trees. And of course, there's a number of dogwoods planted around the place as well, because that's what I hold the national collection of. Well, hang ten on that, because we'll, we'll go deeper in. And we also need to meet the nursery oh, guardian. Yes. yes. The cat. Yes. The cat. Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll meet Mildred. Meet Mildred. <laughs> yes. All right. Let's continue the journey in and we'll go and find Mildred in a second. Yes. But so what I'm curious about then is what was your ethos when you started? So you said you came here with material from the family nursery. Yes. But that was much more of a traditional oh, yes. plant yes. nursery. Yeah. We grew rhododendrons, camellias, conifers. It was wholesale and retail. Mm. Uh, so we grew things in quantity, but I was able to bring quite a lot of young rhododendrons and I selected mainly the more obscure ones. So <laughs> of course that, you did. That helped me to sort of start the rare planty thing going. Mm. Uh, and I've always collected. So even when I was a kid at the family nursery, I was collecting rare plants and mm. my father would look at them and go, what are you going to do with that? In fact, he tended to call them Stephen's weeds because uh, he could never really see the commercial benefit of it. And even when I started here, dad would walk in and he'd say, why haven't you got some potted colour? That always sells well. So well he, which is true. <laughs> yeah. So your father was much more a retailer. Oh, yes, yes. And, and I'm just this idiot who has a whole pile of rare A collector. Pine. Yes, a, co a collector who should be independently wealthy so that I actually can just keep collecting without worrying about having to actually sell it. Oh. There you go. Can't do that. So I moved in here. Uh, I started collecting straight away because I realized I had to do something different. Mm. The general garden centers and nurseries that were out there. And even at that stage, some of the big uh, barns and other things were starting to have some impact on the trade. Mm. We're going to spin around. And I felt that the only way I could be seen as completely different, apart from mm. the fact that I'm That you unique. are different. <laughs> yes, uh, is to have plants that were quite different. 
Now, what I collected had to be something that wasn't regularly available commercially. Mm. It had to be obviously ornamental. Mm. Uh, so my definition of rare is somewhat spreading. Broad, a broad generous. Yeah, generous thing. So they can be rare in the wild. They can be rare in cultivation. They might be brand new and suddenly become popular and then I'll drop them. Mm. And so I try and have as much diversity as possible, keeping in mind that I have to be able to grow things in my climate with mm. the minimum of adaptions. I mean, I've got a shade house, I've got a, an igloo, but I don't have any heated greenhouses or anything like that. So yeah. anything I grow has to be able to cope with my climate with the minimum of attention. All right. Well, we're at the office, which we spin around. Yes. There yes. it is. Yes. Most people can't find it because it's sort of in amongst the foliage of everything. Now, we've done a few stories here because the, um, the vine growing over the entrance is the silver vein creeper from China, Parthenosis henriana. Now we did a video about unusual creepers and we chose this one because it is one of the few that likes shade and yep. colors better in the shade. Yes, in fact, its autumn color is much better in the shade because mm. the white veins through the leaves yeah. disappear if you plant it in the sun. Yeah. And the white veins stay there when the leaves turn red. So you can imagine it's quite a spectacular sight. And also growing up through here, which you can't really see at the moment, but is the, the Chilean bellflower. Yes, there's some Lapageria growing there. There's also a white wisteria that's worked its way way up through the Arbutus. Oh yeah, I can just see yeah, that. Yeah, so yes, I don't like to waste space. No. <laughs> All right, well, let's not waste space and go into your office. And I just want to show everyone your library because I love a library. Oh yes, so do I. Come yes. on. I... Well, we were in your office and who's this, Stephen? This is Mildred. And Mildred was named before I really checked. So Mildred's a boy cat and it moved in here as a stray. Mm. So it's a purebred British short hair and it's got different pronouns than it should have. <laughs> and it's a very modern pussycat. Yeah, it's a very modern pussycat and everybody loves it. Mildred has a, a fan club. So there's people that come to visit the cat, which is not quite what's meant to happen. And mm. now Mildred wants to get down. Well, to Mildred. Mildred can get down yes, all right. because the subject matter here is your library. Yeah. Now, how important is a library, this library, to you? How often do you consult these books? All right. Well, less than I used to. Because mm, you know everything. Well, it's not so much that. It's just that you've got all of that electronic stuff in front of you as well. Right. So I will often now go to my phone before I go to my library mm. uh, and check out the name of a plant. Admittedly, I know what I can find in each book. Uh, so if I know there's a good image there that I can show people or a good piece of, of writing that explains the plant really well, mm. then I do turn to my books. Mm. But really, in this day and age, it's becoming so electronically organised that it is actually quite quick to just go, go in and, and type the name in. And I guess because things change so quickly too, they often become out of date. So oh, yeah. I must say, though, that I love books in a library. So, oh, so do I. Although I do do the quick Google, yeah. I also love a monograph. And funnily enough, I'm just noticing Stephen Ryan. Oh, yes. Look. Yes. More Exceptional Plants by Stephen Ryan. Yes. Is this still available? Uh, no, I've got the last copy. So if anybody wants one, they've got to come and see me and I'll sign it. And if they wish me to, I'll dedicate it. There you it go. Well. And you actually, you've written two books. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Look at the author picture. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was written a while ago. So what can I say? You dark that as Lotharia. <laughs> that was probably quite an old photo even at the time. You know, there so. you go. Anyway, so there are your books on the library shelf, as yes. there should be, but also many other wonderful things. Well, let's now step outside and look at some of the other things that you've yeah. grown. And I, wanna, I want you to show us and show the viewers some of the things that survived the fire. All right, we can do that as well. Now, the other thing in your nursery, Stephen, we have actually filmed in front of this sign before, which says Ornamental Plant Collections, Cornus Dogwood, collection held by Stephen Ryan, Dixonia Rare Plants. Yes, so yes, so I hold the National Collection of Dogwoods, although I'd be very happy for somebody to have a secondary collection somewhere. And I think at last count I had... 44 taxa, so 44 different species, cultivars or hybrids uh, of the genus Cornus. And they're all here. They're all growing on the site here at the nursery, dotted around. They're not all in one little spot. Yeah. Um, but yes, every time I get another dogwood, I try and make a space for it. Sometimes another plant has to move away, unfortunately. Well, I did learn to be ruthless from you. Good. And we've made two Cornus videos, which were all shot here largely. Mm. So we'll link those. Yes. And I have to say, it is just one of the multitude of passions. Because I'm not 
a specialist nursery, unless you call collecting rare plants a specialty in one form or another. Mm. I'm forever adding to the range, uh, bringing some old plant back into cultivation or finding something that hasn't been in cultivation and bringing it in and trying to encourage people to plant interesting and different things in their gardens mm. because garden well, gardening in this country particularly, has been dumbed down to such an extent that we're actually losing cultivars all the time. Mm. Hence being involved with national collections to try and keep some of these plants alive and going. And one of your points has been too, that now that it is so difficult to bring plant, well, impossible to bring yeah. live plant material in and hard to bring seeds in, yeah. what we've got is what we've got. And as it gets lost and diminishes, we have no chance to replenish. Yeah, exactly. So national collections are really important for mm. that reason. So I have Cornus here. I hold three collections in the garden at home. What are they? Uh, Acanthus, Osmanthus, uh, and Sambucus. Sambucus. So ah. the, the elder flowers, the bear's breeches, and the Osmanthus. Um, so they're three important genera of garden plants. Mm. And so plus with the cornice one up here, I now hold four collections and that's probably enough because <laughs> it's quite a bit of paperwork to keep on top of uh, and add to as I need to. All right, once again, I'm gonna very cleverly and with super technology spin around yes. because behind us, let's get this lovely branch out of the way, behind us, this beautiful weeping um, conifer here. Oh yes, the big sequoia dendron. Oh, it's dying at the tips. Yeah, it's got. It's had a problem. I had a, a water leak, which I think has uh, killed some roots. So I'm hoping mm. it will recuperate. Unfortunately, all my infrastructure is now well over 30 years old and suddenly I'm getting leaks in pipes and all sorts of stuff. But tell us the story of that tree. All right, well, that tree was bought as a little tiny thing about oh, only a foot tall. Mm. Not long after it was imported into the country by Yamina rare plants in the Dandenongs. Mm. Uh, and I'd seen it in gardens in Oregon and uh, I saw the champion tree which grows in Bodnant Gardens in Wales that I think last time it was measured was 108 feet tall. Mm. And I desperately wanted a weeping sequoia dendron. So that was planted just after the fires and it is now quite a towering plant. But interestingly, the plant in front of it is a cryptomeria, one of the Japanese cedars, yeah. and it got singed, but it didn't get badly burnt. Mm. So it actually reshot again. And I love the plant. It's called Cryptomeria japonica globosa nana. <laughs> and globosa, of course, means globe-like, so mm. rounded. And nana means dwarf. And although that plant is about four meters tall by about five meters or six meters wide, um, it is comparatively old because it does date back to about 1980 when I first started the nursery here. Mm. And I guess it's dwarf compared to the normal form. Mm. So it's all comparative. And that came back as did the contorted filbert, which is just next to it. Well, let's go and have a close look at that. All right, good. Well, we've covered the contorted filbert before because we did a film about contorted and by divaricated, divaricated plants. plants. Yes. Honestly, there'll be too many things for me to link. So I'll put them all in the copy below. I'll just mm. put a list of all the films that we're referencing. Now, this was another fire survivor. Yes, um, this plant actually was given to me by my mother for my 18th birthday. So you can see I was quite a passionate plantsman even way, way back then. And unfortunately, it's not on its own roots. It's grafted. So I've spent the rest of my life not cursing my mother, but you know, going, oh, not again, I've got to get in there and pull those suckers off. But it got burnt down quite low by the fires, but there was enough wood above the graft mm. for the uh, contorted form of it to come back again. So that's all regrowth since the 1983 fires, mm. and it must be four and a half metres, five metres tall now, mm. and quite a broad spreading plant. Mm. And of course, in high winter, when it's completely naked of leaves, you've got these wonderful twisty curly branches and these golden catkins that hang down. It's just beautiful. And if you go and watch the film we made, we did film it in winter with the catkins, although the possums had just decided to eat them all yes. the day before we filmed. So there's, I think there's one catkin. Yeah, yeah, we didn't do too well on that. But and anyway. of course, it just so happens that we have some very beautiful specimens of cornice for sale, yes. right next to it. Yes, so yes, I not only collect, but I do sell, so there you go. The wheels of commerce must yeah. turn. Now, there was something we just walked past, which caught both our eye. Well, you didn't catch your eye, because you grew it. Yeah, but... I knew it was there. Let's go and have another look yes. at that. And it'll just give you an idea of some of the rarities I have. Yes. All right, what you got? All right, this wee plant here yeah. is something that's very rarely available in Australia, and I managed to get a batch of seed recently. 
and it's a thing called Dacasnia fargesii. Mm. And one of its common names is dead man's fingers. Charming. Uh, yes, it's lovely, isn't it? Uh, it's a remarkable plant uh, related to the chocolate vine and that group of plants yeah. that comes from China. Mm. It has blue new growth when the leaves come out in the spring, so yeah. it's a bluey mauve. Yeah. Uh, the flowers are pale lemon and hang down um, in sort of a bell-like form. Mm. And when the flowers finish, it gets sort of grey blue broad bean like pods and hence the name dead man's fingers so it's from china what sort of conditions does it like <laughs> well it's not going to grow well in melbourne i have to say oh because uh, oh, i was just thinking yeah well it could be something to be lovely to have because it grows as a comparatively narrow little upright tree with not many branches mm. so it doesn't take up a lot of space mm. but it grows really well in Ireland. That might give you a bit of a hint. So cool and damp. Cool, moist. That seems to be mm. the go. Uh, it doesn't need to be wet, but it doesn't like to dry out. And it certainly doesn't like uh, a howling hot summer wind mm. blowing through it. Which we get here. We, we did a, a collaborative video with Rachel at Gardening De Winter, and she laughed at the hot wind. Like, what's that? Yes, exactly. <laughs> no hot winds in Ireland. Yeah. Does this, is it um, an understory tree? Does it like a bit of shade or is uh, it? It likes a reasonably open aspect, but somewhere where it's got shade from the afternoon. Afternoon. So you'd want to have a background of, of larger trees and shrubs to shade, or a wall or something yeah. like that, to shade it from the heat of the I'm of just the thinking how I can grow yeah. it in a pot. And anyway. by the way, the, the bean pods mm. have edible flesh inside. Mm. So you can eat the dead man's fingers. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, so here's a bigger question then. How did you hear about this plant? Well, I actually met the plant first when I was in Europe. So I I saw it in gardens in Ireland. I've seen it in gardens in England. Mm. Uh, and one of the rare plant nurseries here bought seed in at some point or another. It mm. might have been Arnold Teese many years ago. So there are a few of them lurking around in some of the cooler gardens in the hill station areas. Mm. So we now have seed available that's locally collected. Uh, and so we can, in fact, just keep it going. Mm. But I mean, it's climatic requirements are such that I'm not going to sell hundreds of this because mm. we just don't have the climatic areas in which people can grow something like this. Mm. But isn't it fun that it's here? It is. But... If you're watching from the Adelaide Hills or yeah, the, maybe the, the Adelaide Blue Hills. Mountains. Yeah, the Blue Mountains, you might the be able to go. Southern grow Highlands. It. Yeah. Call Stephen. There's a rare yeah. tree with your name on it. Yes, well, <laughs> yes, exactly. So I do need to sell some of the little things. But so here's another point then. So you propagated this. Yes, it's a seed as seedlings. Yep. Yeah. Um, how much do you propagate and how much do you buy in? Ah, well, that's actually a very good question, Matthew. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, I would probably propagate about 50 or 60% of what I sell. Yep. I don't do my own grafting and budding. One, because I don't have the time mm. or the facilities to grow the understocks or in fact, the finesse at grafting very well. Mm. So I'm not the world's best grafter. I've done it and I can do it, but mm. I'm slow and I'm all thumbs. And so I'd prefer to buy in from other growers who graft. But if I can grow it from seed, cuttings, divisions, whatever, I try and grow my own where I can. And yet another video that we will link below is our seed propagation ah, yes. epic, which we made. And we also made a film about taking cuttings, yes. I seem to remember. So again, two things that you practice here. Yeah. All right, well, let's continue our journey. Yeah. yeah, let's go and have a look at some more. Come on, Matthew, why don't we go and have a look at my tropical blueberry collection next? So we've come past the contorted filbert and the, uh, the conifers there. I, this seems to me like, when I visit your nursery, coming into sort of the secret back world. So you come through that green tunnel yes. and here we are. And there's always amazing things. But I think all the way hanging along underneath this shade house is your collection of tropical blueberries. So yes. this isn't one, but we'll get to this. Yeah. So how did this interest start? And again, I'm curious because firstly, how did you hear about that whole genus? All right. Well, it's not a whole genus. It's actually a sub group of genera okay. in the Ericaceae family. So right. it's part of the same family that rhododendrons and azaleas and things yes, belong yes. in. Yep. Uh, and of course the commercial blueberry is in the family as well. Right. And I guess I heard about it initially mainly through one species that was sort of commonly grown in Australia, mm. uh, Agapetes serpens, the one that gets the long archy branches with little red flowers. Yes, I'll drop a picture in because yeah. we both had, well, I've got mine from you. Yeah. Um, and we've got a picture of that in blue. Yeah. So that one sort of started me going mm. and I very quickly realized that there was a whole mass of different uh, blueberries from the mountains of the tropical parts of the world. And 
another one would come my way and then another one. And then I got enough of a collection going that I thought, well, I should, just get, going. Yeah, I should just get everything that's out there if I can. Yeah. And most of them have turned out to be surprisingly cold hardy in the winter. Mm. I mean, I keep them under the shade house so that breaks the frost up, yeah. but they'll go down to quite low temperatures. And the shade house, of course, protects them from the worst heat in the summer. Mm. And because most of them are epiphytes in the wild, they grow really well in pots or hanging baskets. So when you think about it, you can have blueberries that you could pick and eat mm. growing in a hanging basket in a shade house. And we actually, we've made a video, of course, about your collection. Now, this plant here is not one of those no. plants. What is this one? Well, this is an Escananthus. Escananthus, well, we believe this is Escananthus bracteatus or a closely related species. Comes from northern Vietnam, uh, again, grows in the forks of trees and things, and is in the Gesneriaceae family, which means it's related to African, African violets. violets. Yeah. Uh, but Columnia, which is a tropical group, you know, the mm. lipstick plant, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that looks more like this and they're in the same family. No, that I see from the leaf yeah. and the flower, but yeah, the, um, the African violet bit's a bit hard to get your head no, around. Yeah. No, no, that's madness. Yeah. Now I, of course, bought one from you and yeah. mine is, is equally, um, bountiful as yours. It's covered in flowers at the moment, but I would say too, mine is doing what yours is doing. Yeah. So you do get sort of scabby older growth. So. Yeah. Should I prune these back? Oh yes, I would definitely go back to find good growth. Mm. And if there isn't anything particularly good on the whole stem- Take it all out? Take the whole stem back. Okay. Uh, and that seems to just refurbish it. And I always grow them in these baskets with the coconut fiber matting in them, mm. because a lot of these plants will actually grow through the coconut fiber as well. Yeah, mine's doing that. And. Um, because it's a tubular flower, our native honey eaters love, love Oh that yes, too. yes, they're really good. Mm. Uh, the only issue with the Escananthus is that they don't get edible berries like the blueberries do. Now, the other thing then I want to point out, which I think I remember correctly, is that you got this from a colleague at yep. the Sydney Botanic Garden. Yes, it was a plant that was sent down to me because the the person who did felt that I would have a more conducive climate to grow it in mm. than the sort of humid climate of, of Sydney. And uh, I don't know what they're looking like up there these days, but it certainly does very well down here. So I guess from your perspective, um, if you're lucky enough to come here, one of the things that you can do is you have these contacts in the horticultural world yeah. that send you things that the average punter like me would never get a chance mm -hmm. at. You then know how to propagate. And now I do have one of these. Well, exactly. And that's the whole point of growing plants, I think. Mm. Uh, there's no point in having the world's one and only. So if in fact... Um, oh, and look, right beneath it are all the baby plants. And yes. look, this one has got massive new growth coming out. Yes, and if you read the big label I've put up in there, it says, look below for sale plants. Because <laughs> these baskets aren't for sale. They're there display go. plants and they're ones I propagate from. So you propagated this by a cutting. Now, yes. how long would it take from cutting to sellable size? That's about 12 months old. Right. So, I mean, this is just one plant. That is a lot of labor and yeah. and I guess each plant will have a slightly different requirement to propagate well. Oh yes, yes. Everything requires different conditions. But mm. having said that, Escananthus is very easy to propagate in all the forms I've had a crack at so far. There you go. But a lot of them are quite tropical, so I can't grow the whole genus. Mm. But this one and another one I've got, which is a more orangey red flowered one, mm. are quite cold hardy. Mm. Interesting. All yeah. right, let's go further down. <laughs> All right, what else have we found? All right, well, another thing that I'm very fond of and tend to collect a little bit, and I hope my customers will as well, <laughs> are the Oricarias. Now, they're a group of conifers, Southern Hemisphere. We did do a video on the New Caledonian ones mm. uh, that are in the Melbourne Botanic Gardens. And this, in fact, is one of them. This is Oricaria montana, yeah. the summit Oricaria from New Caledonia. And like most of the flora of that part of the world, it is quite endangered in the wild. Mm. It only comes from a few summits of uh, the higher peaks in New Caledonia and is very rarely available here in Australia. And so it fits my range well. Now, it is a high altitude plant then. Well, high-ish when it comes to New Caledonia. Well, I guess. Mm. In terms then of Melbourne or, or Southern Australian conditions, is it only going to be a mountain tree like no, no. Or can it grow as well in melbourne? in melbourne botanic garden so oh, of course we saw it there. yeah so yes <laughs> no it has quite a ra range of adaptability mm. uh, there's some good specimens of it at the geelong botanic gardens which is quite close to the coast yeah uh, you can actually see the ocean from the 
botanic gardens. Mm. So yeah, so it will grow in a wide range of conditions, but it doesn't like really, really, really cold weather. So it's not going to grow outdoors in northern parts of the United States or I doubt you'd grow it anywhere in England, except maybe right down south in Cornwall, you might get away with them. Mm. But yes, they're not particularly cold hardy, but they'll cope with heat. They'll certainly cope with humidity. Mm. You grow them beautifully in Florida, I should imagine. I was going to say, yeah, so it can take the tropical end of the spectrum, yes, yes, but it perhaps can. could also grow in Ireland. So maybe yeah. Rachel Garding Duenza. Yeah, she could have a go at it perhaps. And the other thing about them that people sort of forget, although they grow to a large tree, mm. they make fabulous indoor plants until they get too big. Mm. And so you could have it in a big pot as a, a house plant. And a rare, a rare and exotic Christmas tree too. Yes, well, exactly. Yes, you could decorate it every Christmas. So All there right, you go. let's go further down. All Stephen. right, let's see what else we can find. Well, we haven't got very far, Stephen. Yeah, no, we only moved about 10 feet down the shade house, I think. And suddenly another plant of some... I think botanical interest as well as for its rarity and other things. Mm -hmm. And it's another New Caledonian. So you do have, you have a lot of Chilean plants and New Caledonian yeah, plants. And I do find some of the New Caledonian stuff, apart from their conifers, mm. just that little bit too tropical. I tried this one in the garden at home and the frost took it out. Mm. But here in the shade house, it works quite well. Mm. Uh, and it used to be in a genus called Carpolepis, mm. and it's now a Medrosiderus. So Medrosiderus laurifolia, and it gets big clusters of yellow stamen-y flowers, rather like a eucalypt would get. Mm. Or for those who know Pahutakawa or the New Zealand um, Christmas bush, mm. It's flowers are like that, except in yellow. Wow. So beautiful shrub, wonderful glossy leaves, and grows to about oh, 15 feet, 20 feet at max. So it's a large shrub, That's really. That's big. Um, and did you propagate this one? Uh, yes, that one was a cutting I struck from the one that I've lost in the garden at home. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Is this the only one you've got? Oh, no, there's two or three of them in there. So I've, I've got enough to be going on with. So I'll strip some cuttings off them. Well, let's talk about numbers then. So something like this, which is, you know, fairly niche, yeah. an esoteric plant that might have very particular growing conditions, which aren't common. Yeah. How many would you produce? Look, most things in the nursery, if I produce a crop of 10 or more, that's a big crop. Mm. So it's more about having diversity than having large quantities, mm. which of course in this modern day and age where economies of scale are seen as really important parts of running any business, mm. all I can say is that my accountant sees me as quaint. <laughs> <laughs> well, but the great thing is that you know that if you get something from you that there might just be 10 available. Yeah, exactly. Sort of and you're certainly not going to see them growing in all your neighbor's gardens no. down the road. So you've got something not unique, but you've got something that's at least a bit individual in your own garden. Mm. All right, let's try and get further down. Oh, gawks, let's go. <laughs> well, Stephen, we're in a corner of the nursery that I don't often come to, and it's full of uh, succulents. Tell yes. me all. All right, well, I've always grown a few of these, which are called Semper Vivums, and commonly known as house leeks, because they're not one of the more commonly grown succulents, and because they're Mountain succulents, they actually cope with my cold winters, so they're very good from that perspective. So they fit my climatic requirements. And when we went through the millennial drought, it dawned on me that I could actually collect Semper vivums uh, and have a good collection of them. And because most nurseries in Australia, at least, tend to grow succulents with a generic label that just says succulent, they don't have them individually named. I went out of my way to import a whole pile of them from the national collection holder in Devon. And I think I ended up bringing in about 100 different cultivars, all appropriately and properly named so that I could offer succulent collectors Semper vivums with their original cultivar or species name on them. And although I've sort of gone off the boil a wee bit with them, they're still a plant that I grow quite a lot of. And I take pride in the fact that I actually imported a whole pile of varieties correctly named. Yeah. yeah so this is one of the cultivars I imported and this is Semper vivum tip top. Now we're in another yeah. <laughs> magical part of your nursery, which is again at the front. Uh, where there's much larger specimens. So generally, what is in this area? Oh, uh, well, it's quite a mixed bag, I have to say. There's yeah. uh, some more New Caledonian oracarias. There's a few clumping bamboo species. Uh, there's some uh, Chinese elysiums that are related to the star anise. There's some hydrangeas. There's all sorts of different things in here. But one of the things I do have in this shade house are in fact some cold hardy palms as well. Now, we have of course made a film about cold hardy palms and you have some really rare ones. Yes, well this one here is a Parajubea, Parajubea sonchus, or sonca I should say, uh, which comes from northern South America. Mm. Uh, and it's commonly known as the Bolivian mountain coconut. Mm. And it does in fact produce coconut-like fruit, small, mm. but with coconut 
milk in it and coconut meat in it, wow. but just in a very small amount. And I don't know how long you have to live before you get the first coconuts, but it is quite a rarity and something that you're not going to find in most nurseries around Australia. So that is an altitude palm in yep. Bolivia. Yeah. Mm. So it will cope with quite cold conditions. How cold, I don't know. Mm. There's certainly a nice plant growing in the Christchurch Botanic Gardens, but I haven't really seen that many um, parajabayas being grown around mm. to get a sense of what they'll cope with. Certainly it'll grow fine in Melbourne. Mm. They shouldn't have any problems growing in Melbourne. And it seems to be hardy enough to grow up here without a great deal of fuss or difficulty. Mm. Fantastic. I just love poking through here, which Stephen can sometimes be quite difficult because... Because? Um, <laughs> because it can get a little chaotic in your nursery, can yeah. it not? Look, this isn't a tidy garden centre and I don't ever <laughs> expect it to be or try and make it be. Mm. Uh, this is a chaotic, old fashioned nursery. And I'm a bit of a chaotic, old fashioned uh, nursery man. Say, a yeah. tiny reflection of its owner. Yeah, well, exactly. It does reflect my personality in quite, quite a lot. But I think people who are keen plants people don't come into a nursery like mine expecting it to be all regimented and, mm. and all the climbers over there and the Australian natives over there or whatever. Mm. It uh, is a sort of the thrill of the chase. Fine sort of uh, thing here. So people will wander in, they'll wander around, they'll pick out something that they like, uh, but they'll miss a whole pile of things. And the next time they'll come in and they'll find a whole range of other plants mm. they didn't know I had. Well, that's what happens to me. And I do love your tags, which are the thing that often draws me in. Yes. Anyway, let's get out of this and back into the sun. All right, let's. All right. Well, we've come to an end. And of course, I am not leaving empty handed every time I come to your nursery. As you were saying, you know, you just find something yep. that you, you just can't live without. So I've got three tropical blueberries. Well, you've actually got two tropical blueberries and an African violet relative. So you've oh. got another East Scenanthus. So there you go. So you've got th three distinctly interesting plants, one from the Himalayas, uh, one from China and one from uh, South America. There you so go. I've got them from everywhere. Excellent. What have you got on your hands? Oh, I just picked this up as we were walking past and it's one of my favourite plants that pretend to be dead. Uh, this is a New Zealand lancewood, Pseudopanax ferox, and, and only its mother could love it. Well, it is an amazing tree and we featured this too in a video. I can't quite remember which one it was. I think it was the one we did up at Craig Wilson's nursery, Gentiana, where we talked about the New different Zealand. New Zealand foliage plants. So I think it was in that and it might have been in our Aurelia AC film as well. Absolutely. So we'll link all those. Well, Stephen, you do have a website. You don't do e-com. No, not really. No. So you either have to come and visit Stephen at the nursery or phone. Yes. If you phone me up, I, uh, as long as you're somewhere I can send plants to, which isn't America or England. Mm. And in fact, even the quarantine states here in Australia, mm. but I can organize the smaller plants to be shipped out. So mm. you'd need to ring me and talk to me about it. Yes. And of course, Stephen's on Instagram. I'll put his Instagram tag below. So you can always ask questions through Instagram or through your website. Yes, exactly. There you go. Well, there you are, viewer, who asked for a tour of Dixonia rare plants. Um, we could spend all day here yeah, giving yeah. you a top note. There is kind of everything. And every time you come, you do find something different. And I used to come here before I met you properly. And I just love it. I've yeah. always loved it. So Good. it's well, wonderful. Something's working for me then. So that's fantastic. Now, if you want to know what we're doing next week, you'll have to hit subscribe. Yes, and don't forget, if you need to ask a question, pop it in the column below. Make sure that I know where you're from for context, and we will deal with that in our Monday shorts. We will, but until then, we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye, all.